All right. So they, add, they, they tell us that the derivative of some function is that, and f of 0 is 1. And we establish that if we're given the derivative and they ask us about the function that is the derivative of, then we need to take this and be what with it? What's that? Yeah, to find the antiderivative or something like with the integral in some way, right? Definitely is involved. So they tell us what f of 0 is, and then they ask us what f of 2 is. And the key here is that we're allowed to use our calculators. Okay? So the thing to remember here is that the definite integral from a to b of a function is equal to f of b minus f of a. Fundamental theorem of calculus, right? Right? Yeah, Ali? Right? Okay. So, definite integral from for this problem. What do you think? From two? Zero. zero to two? Yeah, zero to two. Zero to two. Uh, of the sine of i dx. Okay, so here's the thing that we know there's a function, and its derivative is this, which means that this function's antiderivative is f. That means that for the fundamental theorem of calculus, if we want to take the definite integral of this function from 0 to 2, then we would take big F, which is the antiderivative of this, which is F. Okay. So F of 2 minus F of 0. Okay. We know F of 0 is 1. We don't know what F of 2 is, of course. That's what we're looking for. If we could find this, then we should be able to have this value equals this unknown value minus this at one to both sides. Okay. We're good. All right. So if you take your calculator out and you put in y equals the sine of pi e to the x over 2, you get this function, this crazy looking thing. And you do second calc, the integral, this is the seventh option. And you go from 0 to 2, you get 0 0.1571175. Three, nearly go to three decimal places, so we'll go to four just to be better than them. <laughs> point one five seven one, then we'll add one to both sides, and f of two is one point one five seven. Oh, they one. Really, really tried to trick you with that one with, there. With oh, this one. With B. Yeah, if you're not. Get you there. If you're not paying attention, you might just answer that one. So watch out. But we're smarter than them. So. Yeah, we're much better. All right, so that yeah. worth all that confusion. It was a pretty simple problem. Just in the wrong headspace. He's okay. Okay, we well, talked about that guy. All right. Let's see, oil is leaking from a pipeline on the surface of a lake. Can you imagine it? Yes. Yes, there's a lake. Mm, your pictures are somewhere. And then there's oil. It's leaking somehow. Maybe from. Uh, Jeez, so good. Huge. Okay, some kind of a tube leaking out into the uh, leaking oil out into the lake, which is bad. Oh, that's really bad. Good. Hey. Uh, okay, so that's what's happening. Forms an oil slick whose volume increases at a constant rate of 2,000 cubic centimeters per minute. All right. So the this. The volume that's coming out of the pipe or whatever that's leaking the oil uh, is leaking 2,000 cubic centimeters per minute. The oil slick takes the form of a right circular cylinder. So if we were to look real close at this, do that. The shape of it would look like this. Okay. That's what the shape of the oil looks like. It's spreading out in a circle, and then, of course, there's a thickness to it. Um, both its radius and height changing with time. So it's not like it just gets spread out. It also gets taller, apparently, or maybe uh, not taller, maybe more flat. But they're just changing. That's what they tell told us. <coughs> The volume of a right circular tri a right circular cylinder with radius r and height h is given by its cat formula. In case you had forgotten, which I hope you hadn't. What kind of a problem is this? 
related rates. Nice. There are rates that are related to each other. There are rates like the rate at which it's coming out, the rate at which the radius is changing, the rate at which the height is changing, um, maybe some other things. All right. um, so when we're thinking of related rates, we should be thinking uh, writing equations, be, uh, thinking of formulas, uh, taking the derivatives of functions to include rates of change and relating them to each other. Maybe we take functions and then take the derivatives of those functions so that from the original function we have rates of change, right? We take the derivative, we take rate of change. And so we take the derivative of some function, we get that how the stuff is changing, okay? So if we relate the volume to the radius in some way, if we take the derivative, we get the way that the volume is changing versus the way the radius is changing. Sounds good. Sounds like a good thing. Maybe that's what we're going to do here. Um, so maybe we write down some things like volume equals pi r squared h. All right. So let's have to think about there. At the instant when the radius of the oil slick is 100 centimeters and the height is 0.5 centimeters, the radius is increasing at a rate of 2.5 centimeters per minute. At this instant, what is the rate of change of the height of the oil slick with respect to time in centimeters per minute? Whew. Okay, so clearly we're relating radius and height, uh, volume. Uh, we're also relating the rates at which the volume is changing, the height is changing, the radius is changing. Okay. So just as a general practice, if you're going to relate the volume to the radius and the height, then it'd be great to have an equation that relates the volume, radius, and height. Do we have an equation like that? Yeah. There it is. I gave it to us. And even if you're not sure what it's going to look like, figure out what the independent variable is, right? What is, what's changing uh, that's kind of controlling the whole situation. So what variable is changing that's kind of got control of the whole situation? Oh, R. Height. R. Height is the thing that's like controlling time is changing. Oh, right? nice. Time moves on. Time is the thing that causes the situation to change. So we'll take our equation and we'll just go and take the derivative with respect to time. Why don't you guys go ahead and do that. Take the derivative of this with respect to time, remembering that well, there's no t in here, right? So it's not like you're just going to come across t as a derivative of t is a 1, right? Every one of these we, we take to be a, a, a function of time, which means that we need to use, uh, like what rule do we need to use to take the derivative of this? The chain rule also, since we have r squared times h, we need to use the what? Product. The product, right? We need to use the product. We also need to use the chain rule because none of these are t themselves. They are functions of t, meaning we have to find like dv dt and dr dt and dh dt will be part of all of this. All right? So go ahead, take the derivative of both sides with respect to t. Remember to use the chain rule. Whenever you're taking the derivative of a variable that's not t, which is all variables of the equation. So let's take the derivative of both sides with respect to t. If we take the derivative of v with respect to t, we're asking ourselves, how fast is v changing with respect to time? Like how many cubic centimeters per minute is the change dv dt? Right? Change in volume versus the change in time. So that's easy. dv dt. Over here we have pi, which is a constant. So we can just take pi, the constant, times the derivative of all of this stuff. And we talked about how this is a product of functions, so we need to use the product rule. Okay? So we start with the derivative of the first function. What's the derivative of r squared with respect to time? 2r. dr dt. Gotta have that dr dt. That's the chain rule part, right? Of the little arrow. That's the chain rule part of this. Multiplying by dr dt is where you multiply by the derivative of the inside function. The inside function is r. What's next to the product rule? Times h. Okay, then we move on. Plus r squared. Don't take the derivative of that. Now we take the derivative of h with respect to time. The h dt. And we're done. Okay. Okay. Use the, the product rule 
here to, to um, take the derivative of this product of functions. When it comes to taking the derivative of uh, r squared, the chain rule with respect to time, so we can see the chain rule likewise for h, and we can use the chain rule, well, really, when you take the derivative of h with respect to time, it's h dt. Okay? We're, time is measured in minutes here, so dv dt is saying, like, how much volume per minute? And dr dt is saying, how much what per minute? R? No, R radius, how much radius? Radius be measured in centimeters. And how much height per minute? How many centimeters uh, per minute is the height changing? Now let's read A, knowing all this stuff with our new uh, function, our rate of change function. At the instant when the radius of oil is 100 centimeters, 100 centimeters, the height is 0.5 centimeters. The height is 0.5 centimeters. The radius is increasing at a rate of 2.5, increasing being a positive. So 2.5, that's how much the height is changing. At this instant, what is the rate of change of the height? Let's see. The radius, sorry, the radius is increasing. The radius is increasing. So radius, radius both 2.5 uh, centimeters per minute. At that instant, what is the rate of change of the height of the oil slip with respect to time? Well, look, what's dv dt? dv dt. <laughs> Which is 2,000 centimeters cubed per second, or sorry, sorry per minute. Uh, we just we're told what r is, what dr dt is, what h is, what r is. And then for dh dt, there's only one thing left. It's a variable. We solve for it by yes. itself. All right. Okay. So part a. We have 2,000 equals i times 2 times r, which they tell us is 100. Uh, times dr dt, which is 2.5 centimeters per minute, times h, which is 0.5, plus r squared, that's 2.5 squared, times the h dt, which we're looking for. You don't get much more of a softball than that when it comes to related rate problems. They tell you the equation that relates the volume and the radius and the height. And then they tell you something about the volume and the radius and the height and how fast some things are changing. They ask you how fast something else is changing. Or they tell you how fast everything is changing and they ask you what's the radius at this moment. So they tell you all that stuff and ask you what's the height at this moment. Yeah? Shouldn't the last 2.5 be 100? Yeah. It should be 100. <laughs> Thank you. You solve it, I'll solve it, we'll see what we both get. Solve the DHT. Okay, well. Solving for here? The H D T. Looking for what the H D T is. So when we find that number, what like let's imagine the situation, the oil spilling into the lake, right? And we're looking at this instant what the H D T is. So if I'm observing the situation, then what does the H D T represent? What like what would I be looking for? What's that? Centimeters per minute that the height of this giant oil slick is is going up, right? So if I'm looking at the very edge of this, okay. if I'm looking at the very edge of this right uh, circular cylinder, I'm talking about how fast it's getting taller at this very instant per minute. Okay, so would you expect that to be a small or a big number? Small. Small. I mean, it's it's not a very tall cylinder to start with. If you think about an oil slick, it's going to be much wider than it is tall. Right. So, what do we get? From zero to six. Yeah. 
A is two questions. Well, here, here's the, here's what it comes down to. Like I said, like if you have an expression that's equal to the correct answer, the decimal or whatever, then you're fine. So if you just like solve, showed how you solve for it, then that's all that matters. Right? So you can take uh, 2,000 and divide it by pi to show that's what we would do. 2,000 divided by pi, and then we would subtract this. Right? You agree? Subtract that. Minus, um, let's see, 200 times a half is 50 times 2.5. So that's. 200. I can't do that in my head. 200 times a half is 100. Let's see. Um, 100. Yeah, because. Yeah, so we get 100 times 2.5, so 250. Minus 250. What would we do then, now that this is all canceled out? Second part. Divide by, Divide by 100 squared. Mm -hmm. 100 squared. It's 10,000. That's the HTP. So, that's weird. I don't know if they would expect you not to use a calculator there. But if they didn't, then this is what you would do. You would just show them the steps for isolating PHDT, and you would be right. You'd get credit for that. Okay. Okay. All right, let's look at part B. The recovery device arrives on the scene and begins removing oil. The rate at which oil is removed is this function. Centimeters per minute, where T is the time in minutes since the device began working. Oil continues to leak at a rate of 2,000 cubic centimeters per minute. Find the time T when the oil slick reaches its maximum volume. Okay, so, so we don't know when it comes, but some device that I imagine to be yellow for some reason, <laughs> or maybe black, black got a placard down there. Okay, so they put a hose in there and then it starts to suck oil out right, and into a truck or something. I don't know. Uh, so it starts to pull oil out, and this is the function uh, that tells you that in any time, um, what the rate at which the oil 
is removed. Okay, so the, the rate at which the oil is removed is changing. The actual rate is changing. Um, so where T is the time in minutes since the device began working. So yes, the longer it works, the faster it takes oil out. The bigger T you put in, the bigger that number is, that number represents the rate. So oil continues to leak out at 2,000 cubic centimeters per minute. Find the time T when the oil slip reaches its maximum volume. Just divide it right now. Okay. So the, the oil's been spilling out and spilling out and spilling out. And then at some point, this machine arrives and starts pulling oil off of the slick, right? So at the instant that it begins, how fast is it pulling water or pulling oil out of the lake? This thing tells you the rate at which it's pulling water out or oil out of the lake. Yeah. What's that? 400. 400 cubic centimeters per minute, right? But that's slower than the oil is coming into the lake, right? So the roll for all volume is still increasing. At two minutes, how fast is this thing pulling oil out of the lake? Say again? 400 times square root of two. So let's go up to four minutes. How fast at four minutes is it pulling oil out of the lake? 800. Still not as fast as what's coming in, right? So it's still growing. It's not growing as fast. It's still growing. It's still getting bigger. When will it be its biggest? Why 25? Right. So right at 25 minutes, it'll be pulling 2,000 cubic centimeters per minute out. And it's 2,000 cubic centimeters per minute coming in. So they're in balance at that very instant. And any time after that, the machine is going to pull oil out faster than the oil leaks into the lake. Okay? Being able to think that way is definitely at least to your advantage, if not necessary. You've got to be able to think about the situation. There's a very simple situation. There's stuff coming in and there's stuff going out. Okay? So, so can we answer part B? Yeah, it must be when the two are in balance, right? Um, and we just need to justify our answer, and we'd have to write something out like that, or maybe you can think of it in terms of some equation, okay? So you can think of it pretty simply like this, okay? B, B, slick will be at max volume. When uh, the uh, yeah, 400 times the square root of t is equal to 2,000, and then the square root of t equals, sorry, 2,000 divided by 400. So by the time the recovery device began removing oil, 60,000 cubic centimeters of oil had already leaked. Oh, that's rough. Okay. 
So that means that when the machine starts, this is 60,000 60, cubic centimeters. That's how big it is. That seems like a lot. Okay. Uh, right, but do not evaluate. That's a nice thing. An expression involving an integral that gives the volume of oil at the time found in part B. So what's that say? Write, uh, write it out. Don't tell it. It's saying that. Yep. But what, like, what, what time are we looking for? What, um, like, describe the whole situation. Okay. Finding. Thing starts to leak oil. Boom. Go. What happens? You find it, and there's already been so much leak. Yeah. And the time you find it is explained in B. The time you find it is explained in B. Yeah. The time. The time that it starts working is uh, marked by what? Like at the time that it starts working, what do we know? Uh, 60,000 60, cubic feet. Yeah. Okay. Centimeters. 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 Cubic centimeters. And then the machine is hooked up and turned on and it starts to work. And it works for how long? 25 minutes, right? It says the time in part B. I thought it no, it's the. Oh. Okay. So it works in first works for twenty five minutes from that time. Okay. And they want us to write an integral that gives the volume of oil at the time found in part B. Okay. What are we going to take the integral of? Apparently, we want to take an integral that when we take that integral, we take the definite integral. It gives us an amount. Of volume. The integral of, of this you're talking about? already know that the, the new thing is this machine starts working, starts taking oil out, right? Okay. So we start at 60,000 cubic centimeters, right? Uh -huh. So once it's gotten to 60,000 cubic centimeters, then like how is the volume changing after that? Still increasing, okay. Um, let's see, it's increasing by how much? Less and less. Less and less. So it's increasing by 2,000 cubic centimeters per minute, minus the amount that's being taken out by the machine, right? Okay. Uh, well, how? What do we know about this time interval? It lasts 25 minutes, right? So how much oil will we put in at this time, or over this amount of time? So let's manage it in two different pieces. How much will go in? I mean, how much goes in is how much goes in. And then we'll take some out, right? So how much goes in at, in 25 minutes if it's going in at 2,000 cubic centimeters? So we're going to add some and take away some. How much are we going to add? 50,000. 50, right? It's going to add that much, but we're going to be taking away also to where it reaches its maximum volume. And then at that point, that's when at 25 minutes, it's going to start to shrink again. Right? So would that be like the integral from like 0 to 25 of 400? Yeah. Ooh. Minus definite integral from 0 to 25 of, really, we could write R of t, if we wanted to. Because that, that, that is what that is, right? And we don't have to evaluate it. So if we put R of t dt, they, I mean, that's correct. 
when, when they read the exam yeah. and read through it, that would be correct. Dunzo. We never watched the answer to that thing. The thing with the twos and the X and the O's. Oh, well, I'll have to do that sometime. But not right now. <laughs> you have to come up with ideas for this. Okay. So this part right here measures. Well, what does this part, what, what does this function tell you? How much oil do you need to take out? Oh. Yeah, the rate at which the oil is being taken out, right? You can put in a time t, and at that moment it'll tell you exactly how fast this machine is working, okay? So it's a rate of change function, right? Cubic centimeters per minute. So if we take the definite integral of something that's a rate of change, right, we get the, uh, we take when we talk about the antiderivative of this function, this is how many cubic centimeters are changing per minute, so the antiderivative of that function would be a function that tells you what? <laughs> so if this is telling you how fast the volume is changing, this function right here, not, not this part, but just this part, that's telling you how fast the volume is changing. When you take the antiderivative of that, that would be a function that tells you what? How much volume? What the volume is. What the volume is, Derivative, how fast the volume is changing. Take the derivative, how fast the rate of the volume is changing. Right, like acceleration. So when we take the antiderivative of a function that tells us how fast the volume is changing, we find out something about how much volume there is. Keeping that like three function hierarchy in your mind will be really useful. Function, rate of change of the function, rate of change of the rate of change. Position, speed, velocity. That's kind of the analogy for all of those. There. Check it out. Make sure we did it. Make sure we did. Um, See, so they took. They took a little bit of a different approach. They made the like the overall rate of change of volume function one function where they take 2,000 minus R of T. But if you separate this into two different integrals, you'll get what we got, 2,000 times 25, right? That's how much you add. And then the integral from 0 to 25 of R of T will be how much is being taken out. So what are they looking at? They're looking for limits and initial condition, okay? 60,000 and the limits of the integral and the integrand, the integrand being uh, either this or the way that these are. The integrand is the thing that you take the definite integral of. It's the function you're taking the integral of. Alright, so last one in our packet. Particle moves along the x-axis, so that its velocity is given by a differential function v, whose graph is shown above. So this graph tells us what about the particle? Speed is velocity. Speed is has no positive or negative velocity. It's positive or negative. Um, so if it just right off the bat, before you even think about anything else, if it tells us this, this function tells us the velocity. What if they ask us about its position at any time? We have to look at the antiderivative. Which, what does the antiderivative have to do with this graph itself? Or the definite integral? If I take the definite integral from 0 to 2, how would I find that looking at this graph? The area. The area under the curve, right? The area between the curve and the x-axis. Okay? So if I were to find the area under the curve from here to here, what would that be telling me about the particle? How far is it? How far it's moved from zero to zero. Yeah. Exactly. How far will it, which direction will it have moved? Negative. In a negative direction. Yeah. Which will, well, let's say left. It's moved left some amount. Okay? Let's see what they, uh, what, what else they tell us. The velocity at is zero at t equals zero, is zero at three, zero at five, I think is what they're going to tell us. Zero at zero, three and five. And the graph has horizontal tangents at, one and at four. So 
pretty much what you would kind of assume about the graph that they're telling you for sure. Right? It looks like it crossed the x-axis at certain points. It looks like it has a max and a min at certain points, and it's just confirming that, yeah, there's a minimum there, a maximum there. The areas of the regions bounded by the t-axis and the graph of v on the interval 0 to 3, 3 to 5, and 5 to 6, 0 to 3, 3 to 5, 5 to 6, oh, line there, are 8, 3, and 2, respectively. So this is 8. I get to be negative, right? So what does that mean? So this area from 0 to 3 is negative 8, so what does that mean the particle has done? It's on the left, left 8. Okay? And the next uh, 8, 3, and this is 2, which I get to be negative. So what could you say about this particle over the entire interval from 0 to 6? It's moved more negative? Yeah. How much? They gave a specific value. Seven. Seven. Negative seven. Um, areas of regions bound to that, 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 that. At time t equals zero, the particle is at x equals negative two. So if it's at x equals negative two when it starts, and how far does it move? Seven. Move seven to the left. So where does it wind up? Negative nine. Negative nine right? We're just kind of Asking questions ourselves, they may even ask those are exact questions and we'll be able to answer them. Let's see. For the times 0 to 6, find both the time and position of the particle when the particle is farthest to the left. Justify your answer. Is it farthest to the left here? Here? No. Is it farther left even here? Okay. Is it farthest to the left here? No, because it's done what from here to there? Right. It's moved to the right. Okay, So it's moved to the left 8 and to the right 3, and then what happens from 5 to 6? Okay, so at what time is it furthest to the left? At 3, because at 3 it's moved negative 8, and it's moved to the left 8. Then it moves up, it moves to the right three, and then only moves back two, so it never quite get, gets as far left as it was back here at three seconds. Okay? So part A, T equals three, and then, you know, write out something like we just said. Okay? You could write it in words, you can write it using integrals. Okay? The definite integral from zero to three of V of T dt is negative eight. The definite integral from 0 to 5 is such and such. The definite integral from 0 to 6 is negative 7. And then say, well, it moved the furthest to the left on that time interval from 0 to 3. Um, so that's the time. What's the position? How far to the left is it at time 3? Negative 10. 10. It started at negative 2. Moved negative 8. It's at negative 10. Keep in mind, the stuff that I just wrote down is not good enough of an answer. There needs to be explanation. But you can definitely just write words out and say, well, this happened, it started here, it went to the left, and so on. Okay. For how many values of t, where t is between 0 and 6, is the particle at x equals negative 8? Explain the reason. How many times is it at negative 8? Twice. So why why do you think it's been there twice? When it is going eight to the left and into the first time uh -huh. on the way, and then as it's coming back, go ahead again. Okay. Does it hit it again when it goes back again? Let's see. It starts at. Oh no! I did not. Starts at negative two, so it starts at negative two. Here's zero. It moves back this way, right from here to here. It moves back eight, so it's at negative ten. Then it moves. We go from like here, and then it goes forward three. All right, so here's here's negative eight. If it moves forward three, then it's where? Negative seven. Negative seven. So it passes negative eight again, and then it moves back. How much? Two. Back two, so then it comes back here and it's at 
negative eight and nine when it stops. So yeah, it's been at a, a position of negative eight three times. So the answer is three times. Our explanation is uh, maybe a picture and a little bit of some some words saying what's going on. Uh, the interval, the interval from two to three, so from here to there. Is the speed of the particle increasing or decreasing? Give a reason for your answer. Okay, so remember that the key word here is speed. Well, speed, and explain is key too. Speed, though, is what we talked about. Speed is always a positive value, right? If you're moving faster, regardless of which direction you're moving in, your speed is increasing, even though your velocity might be increasing. Okay? So let's talk about speed and velocity. Or speed and, and, uh, and acceleration. Well, let's talk about speed in terms of velocity and acceleration. Okay, so your velocity is positive. Your velocity is positive. Okay? Now, if your velocity is positive, you're moving forward, what would also have to be true for your speed to be increasing? measure acceleration. acceleration. Positive acceleration, positive velocity, right? So for you, left to right is positive, so you're moving positive, right? My speed's not increasing, it's, it's staying constant right now, but if my acceleration is positive, also I'm speeding up, my speed's increasing. Positive velocity, positive acceleration, speed is increasing. If I'm moving backwards, my velocity is negative, okay? For my speed to be increasing, my acceleration would have to be if it was positive, my speed is my, my velocity is negative. My, my my acceleration is causing me to go more and more this way as time goes on. So slowing down until my acceleration makes me go positive like it wants me to go. Mm -hmm. Positive acceleration is acceleration in this direction. Negative acceleration is acceleration in this direction. Positive acceleration accelerates me to the right, and acceleration, negative acceleration accelerates me to the left. Or forward or backward or however. Because it's negative, so when you go, it's going to be slowing down. If they're both positive, velocity and acceleration are both positive, my speed's increasing. Yeah. If velocity and acceleration are both negative, also speed is increasing. If velocity is this way, and acceleration is this way. Accelerations make me go backwards faster and faster and faster. Right? So negative velocity, negative acceleration. So if our speed's increasing, then we have to look to see if one of two possibilities. First possibility of speed increasing is what? Velocity is positive. Yeah, yeah. And acceleration. Acceleration positive. Possibility two. Both positive or both negative? Thanks. All right. So let's look at this graph and determine whether the velocity is positive and if the acceleration is you know, what are we looking for? So, uh, from times two to three, is the velocity positive or negative? Why is that? Right, this graph tells us, the y value of this graph tells us what velocity is, right? So like at these times, the velocity is zero. It's stopped. It's not moving. It's not moving here either. It's not moving here either, okay? If the graph is down here, then it's moving negative. It has a negative velocity. And from, uh, if it's above the x-axis and the t-axis, it's moving in a positive direction. Okay, so it's, its velocity is negative, so the acceleration needs to be So from here to there, is the acceleration positive or negative? Well, acceleration and positive. Okay, so how do, we, how do we look at this graph and determine what kind of acceleration it is? The slope? The slope, yeah. Right? The derivative of position is velocity. The derivative of velocity is acceleration. We have the velocity function, so we take the derivative of the velocity function. The derivative is so our velocity is negative, it's, a, it's got a negative y, but the acceleration, the slant of the velocity function, 
velocity graph is a positive slope, so our speed is decreasing. We're moving in a negative direction, but the acceleration is wanting to take us this way more and more and more. And eventually, eventually it does. At that moment, you stop, part of it stops, and starts moving in this direction. So the speed of the particle is decreasing. We can simply say the value of v of t is negative, the value of v prime of t is uh, positive. So this can be decreasing. During what time intervals, if any, is the acceleration of the particle negative? Where is the acceleration negative for this particle? From zero to one. From zero to one, because then we have a zero slope, which means the acceleration is zero. It's not going faster, it's not going slower. But all along here we have negative slopes which are interpreted as negative accelerations. Okay, then we have what kinds of accelerations? And non negative. So from zero to one and from four to six. the last one. Okay, so we're going to write an equation for the line tangent to the graph of f. We're going to write an equation of a line. What's the equation of a line? Look a lot of different ways. Y because mx plus b is right there on the, the our frontal lobe, so we'll use that. So if we can figure out what m is, what b is, then we've got it, right? Yeah. I'm thinking as calculus students, we should be able to figure out m, right? Because m is so close. Well, we got a way to find it pretty easily, right? It tells us. Write an equation for the line tangent. So now, there's there's an infinite number of lines that can have equations, right? Because this function is like some curve, and we're just looking at the equation of one tangent line. Okay, which tangent line? At x equals e squared. So we need the slope at e squared. How do we find the slope at e squared? Well, actually. <laughs> They already derived it. That's nice for us, right? So f prime of e squared equals one minus the natural log of e squared over uh, e squared squared. What's the natural log of e squared? Not the derivative of the natural log of e squared. It's just the natural log of e squared. It's two. So one minus two over e to the fourth uh, negative e to the negative 4, it doesn't really matter. We don't have calculators here, so that's how we say what our slope is, negative slope. So, so far we've got m. How about b? How are we going to figure out what b is? Plug it into the first function. Plug what into the first function? The e squared. For what reason? To get y. Okay, so if we have an x, which we do, it's e squared, and a y, which we can have if we put e squared in here. That'll tell us what the y is, right? Yeah. So we'll put e squared in there. So 
So f of e squared is the natural log of e squared over e squared. So that's 2 over e squared. So the, we have the equation of the tangent line, or, or uh, we will soon have it. Uh, 2 over e squared equals uh, negative e to the negative 4, or negative 1 over e to the 4, whichever you like, times e, which is e squared, plus b. Now we're going to solve for b. Let's see, 2 over e squared equals, what is this? It's not negative e. Plus e to the negative two plus e to the negative two. Right. So let's see, two over e squared plus one over e squared. Right. That's what this is. E squared is three over e squared is b. So y equals m x plus b. b. Find the x-coordinate of the critical point of f. Determine whether this point is a relative minimum, maximum, or neither. The function is just by x. It says find the core criti critical point. Apparently there is one. Where do critical points happen? Where the slope equals zero. The slope equals zero, where the slope is undefined. But we'll, we'll uh, yeah. Like this, this function doesn't have just like one vertical asymptote that kind of makes it skip over it. It ends. Like the domain, well, yeah, x has to be bigger than zero. The domain's already given. We're going to find the critical value, which means we're going to set the derivative equal to zero. Y minus the natural log of x over x squared equals zero. Multiply both sides by x squared, you get one minus the natural log of x equals zero. So under the natural log of x equal one, what? At e. So x equals e. So we got to figure out is this a maximum or a minimum? Or is it neither? Is it something that kind of goes zero and then keeps going? How do we figure out if it's a maximum or a minimum? Do the second derivative. Uh, maybe we don't want to take the derivative of that function. Right. Probably a little faster. Than should we just go to Well, we don't want to go for f. We want to go f prime to see. Oh. So we're going to go look at f prime. What are we going to do with f prime to figure out if this is a maximum or a minimum or neither? Go on the left and the right to see what the slope is. Is it switching positive or negative? We must have a maximum. Negative or positive? We must have a minimum. Doesn't switch? It's not either. So we'll plug what's to the left of e. What's to the left of e, but here's one thing. You can't put zero in. Oh, well, that's one bigger than zero. How about one? One is pretty easy. What's the natural log of one? Uh, one. Oh. Oh. One minus the natural log of one. What? Like this is base e. Remember what? Oh, e to the one is one zero. zero. Oh, yeah. Over Check. over e square. No one square. So one over one. One. <laughs> so the slope is importantly what? Positive, it's positive. So we're going to go to the right of E. What's to the right of E? Uh, what is E? That's like 2.7. Like 2. 3. 2. So, so yeah, 3 is to the right. 4. How about yeah. some value that's easy to put into an actual log? E squared, right? Ooh. We got 1, which Whoa, is E to the 0. We got E, we got E squared. <laughs> now we put E squared into this function already. What? Right? Oh, yeah. For the first part. What do we get? A positive or a negative slope? Oh, negative. 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 Yeah, we did that. We did that. <laughs> we did that right here. We got a negative slope. Oh, negative. Okay. So we already know f prime of e squared is negative. 
So we have a local max. Max, yo. Positive to negative. I'm going to write that on all my task answers after I read this. Is just put yo. I love that. <laughs> max, yo. Let's see the talking? graph of a function f has exactly one point of inflection. Find the x coordinate of this point. We need a, if we're going to find a point of inflection, we're going to have to do what? Take the derivative of the derivative that's given. 1 minus natural log over, x, over x squared. Let's see. Uh, let's see. 1 minus f of x equals 1 minus natural log over x squared. We're going to take the derivative of this. We need what? Figure out where this point of inflection is. So what do we do with the second derivative? Equal to zero. Equal to zero. Okay. So when uh, <laughs> let's see, I'll also multiply these together as we go. So x squared times negative one over x is going to be negative x minus two x minus two x natural log x, and that equals zero. And solve for x. negative x minus 2x plus 2x natural log x. Did you factor out of 2x? Um, I guess we could out of these, but then we would kind of leave this guy out. Maybe we'll put these together. Negative 3x plus 2x natural log x equals 0. We got natural log of x equals 3 halves x. <laughs> or, no, it equals 3 halves. and then divide by 2x and we get 3 halves. So e to the 3 halves is x. Right? e to the what is x? e to the 3 halves is x. Right? e to this exponent is that. Okay. So there's only one point of inflection, only one candidate for point of inflection, which is e to the 3 halves. Like we didn't come up with two solutions yet. So e to the 3 halves must be the point of inflection, or at least the x value of the point of inflection. And that's what they asked for, right? The, find the x coordinate at this point. And lastly, what is the limit as x approaches 0 uh, from the right of f of x? So it's like, when, it, when it's like that, it's like saying it's when the right side going to 0? Yep. Okay. As x approaches 0 from the right, of, so numbers that are bigger than 0. Because I always think when I the right, I always think it's like going to positive. Yeah, but it's, it's not. Yeah, it's a little bit tricky that way. So the limit as it goes to zero. Oh, wow.
So we can think about this. The natural log, let's say, of 1. Like, let's start at 1 and start to come at 0 from the right. Okay, so what's the natural log of 1? 0. 0. OK. 0 over 1 would be 0. Okay. Now let's, uh, let's get closer to 0. Natural log of, say, 1 half. So what kind of exponent would you have to give to e to get one half? Mm -hmm. A negative one. A negative something. Right? Uh, I have a question. Yeah. How come the that one's not over one half? Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So this number is going to be a negative number, and this number is going to be one half. So we're going to take a negative number and divide by half. It's going to be negative number times 2 so is going to be even bigger than this. Okay. Let's go the natural log of 1 10 over 1 10. So what's the natural log of 1 10? What kind of number is that? What kind of exponent would you have to give to e to get 1 10? Negative 3? Yeah. I'm going to have to guess at it. But it's going to be a big negative number. The smaller this number is, the bigger e, the, the, the bigger the negative power is going to have to be for e, right? Because this is what's yeah. happening. e to some negative number is going to be 1 over e to that positive number. Right? So the bigger we want this denominator to be, the smaller the overall number, the bigger this has to be, the bigger negative this has to be, right? So this is going to be a bit bigger and bigger and bigger number, negative number, so we're going to have natural log of 1 over, say, 10,000, very far in the negative direction, right? Divided by 1 over 10,000. So we're going to take a, a number that's very far in the negative direction, and then we're going to what, multiply it by 10,000, making it even more bigger in the negative direction. So the limit of this as x approaches 0 from the right is? Negative infinity. Touch it on the lunch. <laughs> 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 